the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 724, Back to School Edition, for Monday, August 27th, 2018. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show that takes your questions. We take your cool stuff found. We take your tips. We take your rants. We take your fish shakes. We mix it all together into something where we can each learn, yes, at least five new things each and every time we get together. That's the goal. That's the idea. That's what we do. That's how it is. Sponsors for this episode include LinkedIn Jobs or at LinkedIn.com slash MGG. You get 50 bucks off towards your first job post. MaxSales.com, the other world computing folks and their new Thunderbolt 3 10G Ethernet adapter. And Jamf Now, where you can sign up at Jamf.com slash MGG and get your first three devices free for life. We'll talk more about each of them shortly here. Here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How are you today, Mr. John F. Braun? Fantastic. And like I mentioned, Dave, as we kind of discussed in pre-show, um, it's back to school week. Now, we get the notice because they park a big old yellow school bus on our green and say, hey, look out for this thing and don't run over the little people that come out of it. Right. It's pretty much what they're telling people. And even today it was, uh, it, it was chaos. I mean, there were you know, kids walking everywhere. It was just crazy. So uh, watch out people. It makes me sad though, John, I just dropped my daughter right. off at, uh, at college for the first time. So, well, it made me sad because it probably lightened your wallet a bit. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, that, that happened about a month and a half ago, but, um, but yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I miss her. It sucks. I mean, it's great. It's like all of those things simultaneously. So it's just how it goes. But it does, it's not easy. And yet it is easy. It's like it's where she should be. It's great. It's good. It's just, you know, we have oh. a we have a Skylar sized hole in the house now. So it's like oh. it's missing. Yeah, it sucks. But, but we're I gotta here say, to do this. Yeah, go ahead. But yeah. we are in this day and age where communicating with the wee ones. To say hi or see how they're yeah. doing, it's so much easier than it was like 20 years ago when we were going to school. Right? It's totally true. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would have been like now? You know, kids ask you, give us a minute on this, folks here. We, you know, we, we, every now and then we'd like to have a moment. Uh, can you imagine what it would be like? And, and thank you, folks. Uh, what, it, what it would be like to go to college and have a cell phone, John? I mean, it would change Everything like that, that whole, hey, what is everybody doing tonight? Like that whole thing of coordinating plans with people like that was impossible. Uh, I mean, we had to do it the old school. fashioned yeah. way, like talking to people yeah, but like you face to face. Even, it was like, what? yeah, but that was it. You had to go like hunt around and find people. You couldn't text like once somebody left their dorm room. It was like, where are they? I don't know. Oh, uh, they might be at that party or this party or, you know, watching that movie or whatever. It's like you had to just find them. It, 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 well, we we did have the usual watering hole. It's like, oh, well, everybody's probably sure starting off there, so let's go there and see what happens. Right? That, you, that, yeah, that you, was our strategy. You had your <laughs> right. You, no, that's right. You had your starting points. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, now we'll get now to the it's show. dynamic and crazy. But uh, speaking of dynamic and crazy, we have some crazy questions. Well, no, they're not crazy. They're not crazy. But Randy uh, asked. He sent in a, a, a note, and he actually sent. Uh, a screenshot along with it to sort of describe what he was seeing. Yeah. And what was happening is it was a screenshot from mail and the fonts, the spacing between the font, the, the letters was all screwed up. Right. And so uh, that's, that's the background. And that's really enough to know what, what uh, to describe it. He says, and I've had this problem on and off for years. Usually it's on spam emails, so I never really cared about it. And he says, I think I've also seen it on websites from time to time, but I can't say for sure. He says, today it happened with this email, and I needed to know the details of it. I've attached it below. He says, I did all my usually usual Google foo. Uh, thankfully, he says, all the text is actually there. So a short-term workaround is to highlight the text, you know, copy and paste it into like text editor, BB editor, whatever. and uh, 
and then he could see it. So the text was fine. It was just displaying wrong. So that, of course, makes me think, OK, damaged font, right? Because it, it, it especially if it happens in Safari, too, right, that that because mail uses system wide, right. Know. And mail uses WebKit to display HTML emails. Uh, and WebKit, of course, is the engine at the core of displaying web pages for Safari, too. So it's like, oh, OK, all right. And they all rely, like you said, John, system wide fonts. So um, go into font book in the applications folder. If you highlight all the fonts. Uh, and then go to file the file menu and choose validate fonts that should fix that should at least tell you what's going on. And sure enough, Randy kind of headed down that path and then kind of had to sniff around in a couple of different ways, but he found a damaged copy of Helvetica in his user library fonts folder. So not, and it was because it's in your user folder, it takes precedence over the system one. Boom. There's the problem. He removed that problem solved. So, yeah, and Crazy. looking at his uh, and looking at the you know the copy here, it's interesting because certain letters were damaged, like H. It wouldn't show H's. It's right. Like, what? But the other thing I've noticed, so one, font book is your pal. Now you should never have to use it, but the thing is you could have either a damaged font, as you pointed out, you could have duplicate duplicate fonts, like yep. an app could have installed a copy or a different version. Now, for, for the most part, I think most fonts are true type, but they could be postscript or, or other That's true. representations. Yeah. And sometimes you may have multiples. And, and Fontbook does, a, as you pointed out, does a pretty good job. It has a, a fix it up command that should identify and take care of those. You may have to, and I think our friend actually had to do this. You may have, Randy actually, I think, had to dig in manually yeah. to see the problem. Um, and that, yeah, it's a, 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 an app from ages ago installed a, a bad copy of a font and uh, and he suffered. <laughs> yeah, he suffered the consequences. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty crazy. I mean, it, you know, but you're right. Fontbook is your friend. Uh, it can do quite a few things. You can disable fonts, turn them on and off, and it will it will really kind of give you a, a picture and let you dig in and see what's going on with your fonts. So whenever you're having issues like that, Take a look. And of course, if you're like us, you'll probably want it now. Go and run Fontbook anyway, just to see what it finds and maybe, you know, clean things up a little bit proactively. Because, you know, if it ain't broke, fix it till fix it, it is. <laughs> right? Oh, wait. No, no, no. <laughs> but no, sometimes. but you're right. And actually, I'm looking here, like in my, um, one of my folders. So, so this is my user folder, but in library, there's both a fonts, which is empty. So I guess I just have a system font, but then there's a folder called font collections, which kind of worries me now. It's like, well, what's that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. problem is that going to cause? What, yeah. What <laughs> problem is that going to cause? Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, listener Brian writes in and uh, it's, man, it seems like sorting photos and all that's a theme now. He says, do you know uh, what data photos and before it iPhoto use to sort photos when you're importing them? It says, I have 4,000 slides that I had scanned by an outside source. And the created date is, of course, the same on all of these. He says, I have a better finder rename, which is an app. And we talked about it in the last show. It says, and I want to batch convert these files to the appropriate month years that the slides slash photos were taken. I don't know if it is done by file name, file created date, or the EXIF data. Do you? So, yeah, we talked a little bit about this in a previous show and did some research as well. Uh, photos will use the EXIF date if that's there. If it's not there, then it will use the file creation date. I do not think that it will use the anything about the file name as a hint towards the date it might but i would not rely on that i would use a better find to rename and set the exif date on these um but that that would be the, the the best way and and you know if you want to be doubly safe set the exif date and the created date and even the modified date to exactly the same thing and then that way you're you're definitely covered it's going to come and it's going to figure it out so yeah it's crazy though right i mean yeah. Well, it is. And, you know, I've actually had the issue with older photos where you may not have necessarily had a camera that put the proper EX or even put the data in there at all in EXIF, which now, you know, any modern 
right. phone or camera should populate that data with the with the correct stuff, which all of the major photo programs should acknowledge. Should acknowledge. Yeah, right. But this is with, with it being scanned. There's nothing, you know, there's there's no data. To, he has to create it. It's not going to. There's no place. To and then we see the phone. nightmare, which is, oh, OK, well, I'll use the file system. And it's like, well. Like, I guess that's better than nothing, right? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Otherwise, right. it's 1970, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's the <laughs> Unix epic time. Uh, kids, you can ask your parents about that. Actually, no, it's um. so the um, there is something called the Unix epic time, E-P-O-C-H, and it is the uh, first time, uh, I think it's January 1st, 1970, right? Yeah, Thursday, January 1st, 1970. Uh, is the beginning of time for all Unix systems and everything is counted in seconds after that. Truly, this it's just how it is. They had to pick a t- start time and that's it. The original Mac was dated in 1984. Like if you blew away the clock or whatever, it would go back to, to 84. But, uh, but Unix machines all just count seconds from January 1st, 1970. And that's just how it works. So we'll, we'll put a, we'll put a link in the show notes if anybody wants to dig deeper into some that. interesting trivia yeah, as exactly. to why is it 1970 right right yeah exactly. either you're having a flashback or right. or both <laughs> uh, or your wh- battery died <laughs> while we're on the subject yeah exactly while we're on the subject of all of this adam writes in with a cool stuff found that i actually had slotted for later in the episode but uh, but the time is right he says while not as simple as a better finder rename, he says, I have found a free method for renaming files using their EXIF data. So this is if you have um, the EXIF data, but you want the na- the date of the files to match the EXIF data, you can you can do this. Or re- uh, I guess in this case, he's renaming the files to match the date that's baked in by the by the camera. And it's called EXIF tool, E-X-I-F-T-O-O-L by Phil Harvey. And we'll put a link in the show notes. He says it's a command line tool that allows all sorts of info gathering and manipulating of EXIF data. Once installed, a one line command can rename an entire folder of files to date and time. There's plenty of instruction on the site. And he says, I even found a few tutorials on YouTube. We mentioned this. This is a technically a cool stuff found reprise, but uh, it was four years ago. So I I think it's uh, safe to call it just cool stuff found now. So, yeah, there you go. Pretty good. Right. I have, yeah. an, I have another one. I realized oh. to, because I got, I got a, well, I got a couple, but anyways, no, I just looked on my phone and I actually have like at least two things that have the word EXIF in it. So, oh yeah, this is for no other reason. Just run the app store on either platform and type in EXIF and you should get a pile of things. Yeah. So this one's not in the app store and it is for the Mac, oh. right? Because it's a command line tool. So just, <gasps> just heads up. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is like the core of like other things. Like Correct. This. That's right. Yep. And then while we're at it, because here we are, Ian, uh, also cool stuff found, but uh, here it is. He says uh, a recent episode discussed photo sorting by EXIF date. He says, I know you talked about Pathfinder. He says, I do want to say how absolutely brilliant Path- Pathfinder is. Version eight is out now and does pretty much everything much better than the Finder. He says, however, may I recommend Neo Finder, originally CD Finder. He says, this is a dedicated media finder app. It will sort by, amongst other things, EXIF date, which is what we were asked about in the previous episode. He says, uh, you can click on the triangle at the bottom of their, their main window to see all co- sorts of sorting options. He says, uh, I'm thinking of using it as my primary photo cataloging app, having moved from Aperture to Lightroom. And despairing of the subscription model, which is a waste of money for the majority of people who only use a photo program occasionally. He says for NeoFinder, the developer is extremely responsive um, and it'll allow smart folders and all sorts of stuff. So thank you for that, Ian. That's that's great. And really kind of gets us down that path. So good stuff. And yeah, I'm calling audibles left and right here, John, with the agenda. But, you know, welcome to the Mac Geek M, right? That's how it goes. And I'm going to help you learn an okay. additional thing here. Yeah, let's so remember go. we were talking about using the finder to find things using a certain search attribute? Yes. Well, I was just looking here and I thought I'd remind people that at least on my system, the one I'm sending in front of, Dave, if I look at the other search attributes, there are two that have the word EXIF in them. Oh, interesting. 
And actually, it, 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 so that, uh, I mean, that in, in and of itself isn't terribly useful because it says I can either find the EXIF GPS version, who cares, okay. or the EXIF version. But the thing is, if you look in the finder find other category, you will see um, if you have any photo programs, photo related things like the shutter. Speed. I noticed this last time I looked at the list. I was like, oh, wow, I can search on that. Cool. So depending on the software you have installed, you can search for photos either on the EXIF data, though not so much, or attributes of the photo that are important to you. So. Cool. Huh? Very cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, you know what I want to do, John, is uh, I want to mm -hmm. talk about our first sponsor, which is Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. These folks... We say it all the time, and it's because it's true. Uh, they're the first place that John and I go when we're looking for, you know, stuff to enhance or add to our Macs. Really, right? Because, you know, you need a, a, drive, yeah, a drive enclosure. You need, uh, you know. A drive. A drive. Yeah, you need RAM. You need just also any sort of accessory. For example, they've got their Thunderbolt 3. 10 G ethernet adapter. Now that you can, you just plug it into your USB, your Thunderbolt three capable USB C port, of course. And, uh, and then you can get up to, you know, 10 gig ethernet capability right there. It's bus powered, easy setup, energy efficient, low noise, you know, all of that good stuff. And of course, because they're OWC, it works with previous gen Ethernet networks, too. You can connect any wired network to its RJ45 port. Works with, uh, you know, basically, well, it, it says 10.13.4 and later. And even works with Windows 10. So there you go. You got to check this out. Go to MacSales.com. The Otherworld Computing folks, thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Rich wrote in and he um, we've been sort of going back and forth, actually. And Rich is trying to he's got a Linksys Velop network and trying to sort out mm -hmm. why his Wi-Fi speeds are the way they are. And uh, his, he's got a gigabit Ethernet connection, right? OK, hardwired. And then he has and, and then this is a, a mesh system. Correct. One of them. One, one of them. Yeah. And it's a decent one. I, you know, it links this. But but as with most mesh systems, you know, the Wi-Fi is uh, two by two radios in there, which means it's two uh, radios per channel. And that's two streams per channel, perhaps two antennas per channel, just like your iPhone is, just like most laptops are. Your iMacs and your MacBook Pros have three antennas in them so that they can go, um, if, in theory, 50 percent faster, depending on everything else. And so he's been on the phone back and forth with Linksys tech support because Linksys uh, makes the well, I mean, it's Linksys, which is now uh, Belkin, which is now who just acquired. Oh, owner. not again. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, but whatever. Guys, it's, stop it's, buying each other. Well, you know, it's going on here. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> it, you know. He he wound up on the phone with with Linksys, and when you have a two by two radio, the maximum speed of each of those radios is uh, with eight hundred two to eleven AC is four hundred thirty three megahertz. Right, that's the maximum speed. Wait, Theoretical, speed, wait, I'm sorry, you just said megahertz. Uh, megabits per second. Thank okay, you, John. Just, just no, you're hey, right. Yeah, I'm here for you, man. I've got. I appreciate but, um, it. All right. So, yep. so an 802.11 AC single radio stream is 433. Correct. Okay. Because so I was digging in my head for that too. So, so your expectation is that, in theory, the maximum speed is that times the number of radios, either the number of streams, mean, the number of antennas. Yes. Right. So on a two. Uh, two by two means you've got two to send with and two to receive with. So fine. Okay, great. That's your upstream, your downstream. So in theory, we're looking at 866 megabits per second, right? Uh, with an iPhone or, <clears throat> you know, anything that will do two by two, which is what his network is. Or about, I would say, you know, off the cuff, 80 megabytes a second, maybe. Well, theoretical maximum, right? Correct. So the first thing you do is you cut that in half. 
uh, because of the way all this works, right? You're what? never going to, you're, you're, you're not going to actually ever see the theoretical maximum. You're going to get half that. That's how it's always been with Wi-Fi. That's how it always will be. Really? Yeah. That's now what? your actual maximum, right? And then add to that distance interference, you know, whatever signal, qual- yeah, yeah. signal quality orientation of the phone. He's getting, when he does his speed test somewhere, in the 300, 350, maybe sometimes 400 megabit per second speeds. So he had called Linksys about this, which is a, which is about right. That's what you're going to get. That That's to be expected. And I mean, part it, of it is it, what frequency is he on? Hopefully five or not. Well, he's, I mean, it, that, there's, that, there's, there's all these factors. No, 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 no. No, because 802.11ac oh. only operates at the five gigahertz range. <sighs> so he's definitely on five gigahertz, right? All right. Yep. Um, but again, you know, interference, orientation, whatever, you know, impacts this. And and in his scenario, he's able to get uh, faster speeds on the upstream than he is on the downstream. But, okay. uh, you know, when he wires in, he's able to get 900 plus. And so he talked to Linksys and and I feel like they perhaps I don't think it was intentional. In fact, I don't know that they even meant to communicate this, but what they communicated to him and what he took away from the conversation was you should get on Wi-Fi, you should get speeds that are half of what you get on wired. And while that's true in his scenario, that is not a universal truth, right? Your Wi-Fi speed is limited by your Wi-Fi and has nothing to do with your WAN speeds when you separate it out now, when you. Right. Assuming every device and, and we have seen this in the past, but just to bring this up, this point here is if you're ever diagnosing a problem like this, you could have a device that doesn't have a gigabit port. Sure. And I've run into this like certain older firewall products or network protection products. It's like, hey, let's throw 100 megabit. And it's like, dude. Are you serious? Sure. So but, that could be a limiting factor. I, let's I, say, it's not in this case. Let's say that that is the limiting factor, right? Let's say that he's got something that limits his overall WAN speed, WAN meeting his connection to the internet wide area network. Let's say he's got something there that limits it to 100 megabits per second. He's still going to get 100 megabit per second wirelessly from his phone because his phone is right. capable of doing more. It's the whole weak link in the chain concept. When he's got gigabit internet, his Wi-Fi is the weak link in the chain. And that is true for all of us. When you don't have gigabit ethernet, your Wi-Fi might be a lot faster, capable of going a lot faster than your internet speeds. And this is why testing your network with speed test is a potentially flawed way to go. It is super easy. Right. Because you can launch the speed test app on your phone. You can bring up speedtest.net or whatever. I mean, there's there's several different websites you can bring up. But when you're testing your Wi-Fi speeds to a remote server, you are at the mercy of not just what's going on with your Wi-Fi, but what's going on with your Internet connection and everything in between you and whatever remote server is. So if you really want to test your local network speeds, the best thing to do is to use a local network test where the speed test never leaves your local network. And that way you can isolate. And, and it, of course, that that's not really the easiest thing to do, to be perfectly honest. There's uh, a piece sure of, is. Well, there's a piece of software called iPerf that you yes. can run at the command line <laughs> and it, it's fine. I mean, it 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 works. Um, I use it all the time, but you have to go through the process of perhaps installing homebrew or something. Th- Thankfully, we do have an article that will teach you how to use iPerf. Um, and, and really it's, it's quite, it's quite straightforward. So we'll, I'll put that link in the show notes, but, um, but be aware of, again, really the, I think the concept to take away from this discussion is look for the weak link in the chain and be aware of what that likely is. Right. And, and with him, it's not his internet connection with most of us. It is our internet connection speed that will be slower than, uh, than our, our Wi-Fi, right. Even me on a gigabit connection. Yes. My downstream speed is gigabit. That's faster than my Wi-Fi. my upstream speed, 40 megabits a second. So my Wi-Fi can go way faster than that, but I will never see it if I do a speed test. So just I'm bear in mind. Um, yep. In a nutshell, I, I'd be shocked if I saw 
my advertised speeds for my ISP come up during my speed tests when I'm doing it on Wi-Fi. Right. Because I know there's all, as we mentioned, there's all sorts of factors, signal strength and interference and all that stuff here. You should be surprised if you, <laughs> yeah, if your wireless speed anywhere approaches your your actual network, you know, well, internal you, network speed at a, above a certain point. I mean, if you have Wi-Fi speeds, uh, if your downstream is 200 megabits a second or less, I would mm. say it, you should if you you should always be able to see that on your Wi-Fi. But your upstream, I mean, you'll all, you, you should always be able to soak that too, right? Again, 200 megabits a second or less, you're going to, you should always be able to, and if your Wi-Fi doesn't do 200, then you might want to take a look at, at, at stuff. But if right. your WAN speeds are above 200, yeah, it's, you know, and, and honestly, one of the weak links in the chain can be the speed test servers themselves. Some of them won't go to a thousand i've had you know i've done speed tests where it's like 400 megabits a second or whatever well they provision like everybody yeah, else sometimes right yeah right so, they have to yeah they got to manage bandwidth somehow so so i guess the, the 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 takeaway is you know try to identify the the segments of your network where you think there's a performance problem is it your switch could be is it your cable modem is it your wireless access point yep um, and or is it your iphone right because you could have you could have a router that's four by four, right? Which is totally capable. Uh, like the the Synology Ooh. router has a four by four wow. radio. Oh, it does. Yeah, okay. the, the Plume, right? We've talked about the Plume Wi-Fi setup, uh, the mesh system. They have one of the three radios in the Superpods is a four by four radio, and it will use that for front hall. I noticed it actually with Sky's uh, MacBook Pro, my daughter's MacBook Pro. Uh, I, she was getting like killer speeds, and I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And then I realized, oh, it's a three by three radio in there. Plume's system was smart enough to say that has three by three. It should be on the four by four radio. And she was truly getting, you know, I she was getting 700 megabits per second downstream, you know, from an Internet connection. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, yeah, right. Of course. Yep. You know, sometimes you just got to you got to kick back and say, do I really need all this speed? Can't I just take a little time to just enjoy life and and. Well, and that's at that's, a leisurely pace. <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, above a certain point, you're going to be fine. And I, I would say really above 100 megabits a second, you're probably not going to run into any problems that negatively impact your ability to just do stuff on your on your phone. Or I mean, I looked the other day, so I'm so I'm Netflixing like many of us do. Sure. And the thing is, dude, Netflix takes if you hit the info button, depending on your platform, I looked at it. It's three megabits a second. Well, unless you're f at streaming 4K and then it's 25. Oh, OK. All right. I'm I'm obviously streaming HD. Right. Not <laughs> right. 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 4K. Yeah. But even then, that that's within the cap of most people's Correct. Internet service, I would think, under the cap. So, so you shouldn't get any interruption. Yeah. Even oh. 25. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Really? 25? OK. Yeah, well, that's what it takes mm -hmm. to do 4K. Yeah. So you're doing 4K? No. Hmm. I'm not. Oh, I'm not. just. I'm just aware of that's. Oh, what you it could. Takes. Yeah. Well, I don't have a 4K TV. I yeah, have devices I mean, that would support 4K, as as you do. I think it's just my TV's not one of them. So. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, speaking of videos, uh, listener Adam wrote in, and uh, and he said, uh, "I have a YouTube video that a friend and I made, and we would like to transcribe it for closed captioning, among other things." And uh, he says, I figured I could use voice typing on my iPhone in an app like Lo Notes, cleaning it up after I played it through a decent set of speakers from my Mac with the iPhone near one speaker. But it recognized less than one word in 20, even pausing playback every few seconds to allow for catch up. I then went wanted to try the Mac itself for dictation. Enhanced dictation is on since it's a mini. I don't really have a decent audio input. Uh, and he tried it. He said, you know, he slowed it down. He went through all sorts of things. He says, I'd rather not send it off to a transcription service, and I can't type that fast. Can you recommend a method using any possible pair of Macs and or iOS devices using built-in apps or abilities or a free-to-cheap app to do the listening and typing for me? And I, I'm going to point something out, and I've got your answer for you for certain, but uh, – with our small business show podcast, I'm going to take a little detour here. We've been wanting to do transcriptions of our episodes and we've been trying all these different services, right? 
And, uh, and so similar thing. And, you know, we, um, like, just like we do with Mac geek gab, we publish our audio feed and then we also take the audio and publish that to YouTube. So that, and, and some folks, some of you folks, you know, if you, you find the Mac geek gab podcast channel on YouTube, you can listen to our episodes there and some folks do, and they support the chapters and all that great stuff, right? It's there. So with the small business show, we do exactly the same thing. We publish our, our normal feed and with chapters, and then we publish to YouTube, but also with chapters and all that stuff. And we've been trying different transcription, transcription services. Easy for me to say. Um, as I read Adam's question here, the answer for Adam immediately popped into my head. And for some reason, it did not pop into my head for the last six months when Shannon Jean and I have been messing around <laughs> with transcription services. Oops. Yeah. And it's that I, it, my initial thought, and I just can't believe this didn't come up. You know, it's amazing. You, you approach a problem from different ways and your brain pulls up different information instantly. I was like, well, dude, YouTube will do that for you. And then it hit me. Oh. Yeah, YouTube does do that for you. And it's true. If you go into your YouTube content manager, you have to use the old one. The new beta one doesn't have the ability to see the and manage the transcription stuff, but it'll be there on the web. Like you could you can definitely see it on your videos. You have the little three dots and there's the view transcription. Um, it's automatic. YouTube does it all the time. They do it for every video. But if you go into your content manager, you go to subtitles slash CC section of your video. Uh, you'll see there where you can choose the transcribe and auto sync feature. You can have it retranscribe things or you can download like a subtitles version of your thing or in any other text format that you want. It's all right so, there. You're good to so go. Is it doing it in real time? No, it does it when. Or does it do it when you upload the video? Correct. Does it okay. Yeah, it does it so when they you upload. Have, so YouTube. And I assume others happen to have a feature that transcribes the audio to text when you upload, which that's a great idea. I know. I, <laughs> I'm sure right it doesn't there. always get it right. No, I but mean, you can you correct know. it too. You can like go through and so you can look at the log, and then I the, you you actually pointed out here, yes, that it's output in a standard format. If you many look standard at that. formats, in fact, you can pick oh, and choose. too many, right? Oh, it's great. <laughs> It's crazy, man. So I don't know why it never hit me. And so I immediately, of course, texted Shannon and I'm like, hey, man, here's this thing. He's like, that's brilliant. I had no idea. I'm like, I wish I could say the same thing. I, I did have an idea. It just <laughs> never percolated. But that's how it goes. That's how it goes. All right. Uh, I want to talk about our second sponsor, John, which is LinkedIn Jobs, LinkedIn Talent Solutions. If you need to hire somebody like that can the right hire can make a huge impact on your business. And that's why it's really important to find the right person. But the trick is finding someone. And oftentimes the right people aren't necessarily looking for a job right now. But when the right job shows up, they might just take it. And where are you going to find people that are not looking for jobs, but are have listed their qualifications for you to sort by and search by and even pitch to where is that LinkedIn? Think about it. Like 70% of the U S workforce is already there. And LinkedIn jobs uses that to match people to your role based on more of who they are, their skills, their interests, even how open they are to hear new opportunities. LinkedIn jobs gets your job seen by the right people. And I have used this. It is fantastic. And you can get a $50 off your first job post. And, and, and that may be enough to get you the person that you're looking for, right? It, this is, it's a good deal. So check it out. Go to linkedin.com slash MGG and get 50 bucks off your first job post. Again, linkedin.com slash MGG to get 50 bucks off your first job post. Say it with me, linkedin.com slash MGG. That's right. Terms and conditions apply. It really is. It's great. It works. <laughs> Trust me on this. Our thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. <laughs> you all right there? Uh, yeah, no, good. I just, uh, I, I liked your spin on LinkedIn. It's, uh, it's we're, we're all on LinkedIn or we we're should be. all right? on just LinkedIn. Find out what's happening. Man. Exactly, man. Yep. I get That's the great. alerts. It's like, hey, you know, your friend just got a promotion. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. or your friend got a job. Yeah. Like, like you said. Yeah. It's great. That's how you do it, man. That's how you do it. Yeah. 
All right, moving on to uh, to Damien here. We've got some tips and uh, maybe a couple of questions and stuff because it's what we do. So um, Damien said, while manually sorting some email on my iPhone, I accidentally tapped on the double arrows for some grouped emails. iOS Mail then flipped the arrows to point down and showed me the individual emails under the group organized by date. He says, I don't know how long this feature was there. He says, but I never noticed it before. And I find it hugely useful. If there wasn't something, if there wasn't anything that, that like epitomized the quick tip, that's this, the thing that might seem obvious to you might not seem obvious to you, but that's the point, right? It's not necessarily obvious to everyone. So if you didn't know this great tip, thank you, Damien, for sharing that with us. I love, I love quick tips like that. Don't you? I thought you would. Uh, Jan wrote in and uh, sort of buried a, a quick tip in a in a question, but uh, he reminds us. He 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 says uh, my mid twenty eleven twenty one inch iMac uh, gave up sometime before the summer. He says uh, an external hard drive can still boot it, but that's about it. He says what I'd like to use use the iMac as a monitor for my mini. And he says, do you think that target display mode would work? And the answer is yes. You can take uh, an iMac and turn it into a monitor. You connect your mini display port in the opposite direction. You make sure that the machine that is going to drive things is logged into a user account on itself. Your iMac doesn't necessarily need to be in any state other than on. And then the magic is control or oh, sorry, command F2 and command F2 will uh, make uh, uh, what's called target display mode. Just that's it. It it works and it turns it into a relatively expensive uh, display. But if if that's what you need it for and or it won't do anything else, then there you go. So so the port of the machine that wants to talk to it is display port. Yeah. Yeah, you would run. You and would, then the port on the Mac, once you put it in target display mode, is also yeah. display port. So on is the, it display? So so the the hardware that you would need to connect them. I, I just want to be clear on that. No, this is great. Yeah, it's a mini display port. It's not display port. It's the mini display port cable, yeah, okay. the little one. Yep. And and you just connect it, connect two machines together and you're good to go. And I and I suppose for Thunderbolt based iMacs, you can do that, too. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So target display mode. Again, just one of those things to remind us of because it's it's always there. Um, we have been talking a lot about SSDs and we talked about the whole concept of garbage collection, which is where uh, a cell on the SSD is marked as available. But before something else can write to it. It needs to be wiped out, which takes an extra cycle in the process, and that can slow things down. So that's why when you, you know, change a file or whatever, it writes to an already empty spot, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Bob wrote a listener, Bob wrote uh, what we call the SSD egg carton analogy, John, and it really like it helps explain how this works. Now, what's really cool is that he posted this analogy to Apple's discussion forums. And I thought, OK, cool. I'll I'll just read it from the discussion forums while we're, um, you know, while we're doing the show. Uh, I'm now getting a gorgeous message that says we'll be back. We're busy updating the Apple support com support communities. And we'll what check are they back releasing shortly. new product? Uh oh. No, no, it's not the store. It's it's the communities that are the discussion. It's usually a that are bad down. message. Yeah. So um, I'm not actually I'm not going to I I could I feel like I could probably get pretty close. I, I'll, I'll give you the, the broad strokes and I will encourage you. I to, got the same message. We'll be back. We're busy. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah they're, gonna, they're probably shutting it down as we speak. That's right. Okay. So you may never see it. So <laughs> Bob's Bob's analogy is is this. If you have think about the. Uh, SSD as having boxes of uh, like multiple egg cartons and the cells are inside each egg carton, right? So there's, there's 12 cells inside each block. Okay. And uh, 12 eggs inside the carton. 
if you if you have something that's on say block 22 and that's marked as empty it can't free up 22 until 13 through 24 are also able to be cleaned up right because it has to kill the block all, all at the same time not individual cells in the block so the system, when it does its garbage collection, either waits until 13 to, through 24 are marked that way, or it will say, now, nah, you know what, things are inefficient here. And so it will take, you know, 13, 14, 19 and 20 uh, and move those to another block, marking those cells as free. Now it can mark. Now it can clean out that egg carton. So it this is uh, I know it's crazy. This is how it, but this oh, is Oh, no, how it's SSDs not crazy. I, yeah. I, I like the analogy. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. No, and I think it does. But, but to me, the, the larger question is this threshold. Right. So Bob makes an excellent point. The thing is, when do you get to the point where the drive has not yet caught up? You see what I'm? Yes. Yes. See what I'm when driving at here? When there's not enough is, free has space. The dri- yeah. Has the drive gotten to the point where it's trimmed all the cells that can be trimmed? And the bad news is if it hasn't, then you get inefficiencies. Right. If it has, then everything's swimming and and you get optimum write speeds. So, and, uh, no, I, I agree with what he's saying. It's a, h- How do you determine what this figure is? And I don't know if there's necessarily a tool available to us mere mortals that can tell you, oh, here's the, per- do you know about this? I mean, I'm, I'm, no, I'm just, I don't. Yeah. I, I, I mean, see I'm what just, you're asking though. Like, how do you know? Could you have a tool saying X percentage of your supposedly available cells are actually available? So there's some in this state, which is like pre-trim. And then there's some in this state, which is like post-trim, yeah, which is I, what I, you I want to stop you though. We have to not use the word trim for that because I'm going to explain in a minute what trim go. is. And no. And so trim is, well, I get what trim is, but yes, I, I go. Yeah. Using, clarify. yeah. Clean up, right. Is pre-garbage collection, post-garbage collection. That's the right term. Trim is just a protocol, according to Bob here, that the file system can use to tell the SSD that you just Mm -hmm. deleted a file and that the file's data blocks are now free to be moved to the garbage collection queue. But trim. So whenever you'd like to take care of this, yes, please do. But there's no, as far as I know, there's no timetable for this. It's like whenever the drives thinks it should. Correct. Trim is just the file system saying, you may free this up when you want, not do it now. So it is helpful because otherwise the SSD may not know that this is f- freed up, you, you know, because it's got data in it and it, it you know, it might not it, like it doesn't it can't know what the file system knows unless the file system tells it things. And that's what right. trim lets it do. So, yeah. Right. So I'm wondering if our drive expert listeners and we know you're out there because yeah. you make tools that do all sorts of cool things somebody has to have a tool that can tell you this now it may womp on your drive which would be bad sure <laughs> right yeah, of course yeah 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 but it'd be nice to see oh you have x percent uh really clean cells that i can write to and and life is good or your drive is is totally clogged up and it's a piece of junk and yeah almost like like the ssd equivalent of uh defragment or a fragmentation identifier uh it's the wrong right it's the wrong term but but similar concept Mm. yeah yeah well it's like you know what what state is your drive in to receive useful information right right it's either clogged or or, not clogged golden yeah yeah, interesting. All right, yeah, we we, um, we talked about yeah. Please do the feedback at macgeekab.com dot com is uh, is where we want to hear from you. Uh, there, uh, folks. Hold on, my my audio is bad here. I I thought you said feedback at macgeekab dot com. Yeah, no, let me get that right again. It's feedback at macgeekab dot com, and that's where you're going to tell us all about what you might know that uh, that we can help everybody else with. Uh, we have been talking about Apple Care, and now of course it's Apple Care Plus. And listener David has a very interesting perspective. He says, uh, I take a whole home look at this uh, versus a per device look at Apple Care. And he says, what makes sense for, say, a $2,500 MacBook Pro alone may seem fine. 
But add to that the five iPhones, five iPhones, three iPads, and various other Apple devices adds hundreds or thousands to the cost of the hardware, and then add in all the other tech almost all homes have today, such as routers, NAS devices, switches, mesh, TVs, etc. And a whole home literally has thousands of dollars of tech that one could say needs some sort of insurance above the warranty or even Apple Care. He says, so I talked to my insurance agent and she recommended that I take a rider policy out for $15,000 at $65 a year with a $50 deductible per incident. He says this covers all my tech, so I pretty much do this versus any sort of Apple Care. Very smart, David, and definitely worth calling your homeowners or your renters insurance uh, and having this conversation with them because you can definitely get policies that cover things like your phone when you're out of the house. For example, I have, and I don't, I've, you know, again, this is one of those mental disconnects. Uh, I've never thought to do this for my tech. I've done it for some business owned tech, never done it for personal owned tech, but uh, I've done it for my drums, right? All my musical instruments are covered with a uh, $0 deductible per incident because it it was just uh, economical to do it that way. And they are covered even when I am out of the home and they are covered when I am out of the home working and being paid to play a gig. So all my gears covered. I mean, it would be a shame if I, you know, damaged or had something stolen, but at least financially, I wouldn't take a hit um, on any of that. So, yeah, that's real smart, man. I like that. Pretty good. If anybody has another insurance, you know, if, if you found different insurance that'll do this. Yeah, let us know. That would be good. Well, believe it or not, I actually have the same thing. So my homeowner's insurance, Yep. somebody suggested it to me. It may have been you or it may have been somebody on the show. I've suggested so a I lot have, of things that I haven't taken advantage of myself clearly. So, yes. yes, it's possible. But I actually have. So I have uh, my three most expensive computing devices covered under homeowners. And it, and it's a similar yeah. thing. It's like, you know, I mean, it's like under 100 bucks a year. Right. You know, they're, they're just like, yeah, can we have the serial number and, you know, the, the name of the product? And yeah, if it, you know, explodes or gets stolen or something, then they're like, OK, well, you're covered. Right. Yeah. Here's a check. Yeah. So exactly. the deduct- well, the thing is, the deductible is is usually the biggest negotiating factor in a lot of these things. Right. Well, if you just include it and in, under your normal homeowners, then then, yeah, whatever your big deductible, which might be a thousand or even two thousand dollars, depending on, you know, what you've what you've got set up for your homeowners. Right. But that's where the, the rider comes in, because like on our homeowners, I think we carry to modify the terms so right, you can just for those specific things. Like, again, my drums are a zero dollar deductible, but my house, I think we have a thousand or something, what, you know, whatever it worked out to be that was, you know, economical at the, at the time. Um, so you could you could attach a rider that does your electronics at, you know, like like David just said at a fifty dollar deductible. So, yeah. All right. Cool. I want to thank all of our Mac Geek Gab premium contributors who have contributed in the last two weeks. I didn't do this last week. My apologies, folks. Um, But yeah, you were on the road. What's that? You were on the road. You were Uh, doing your thing. Was I? No, I don't think I I I don't. I don't have an excuse. A week before, whatever. Yeah, it was crazy. It's been crazy around here. The summer's crazy. (laughs) It's just how it is. But. it oh, doesn't crazy. mean we're not thankful. In fact, it it means we're even more thankful. Um, and so all of you who contributed in the last uh, two weeks, I want to send our shout outs to. So on the biannual $25 plan, uh, big thanks to Rich F, Kevin S, Harry M, Mike P, David R, Tom M, Matthias S, who's actually on the $30 every six month plan, Dimitri S, Drew T, Jurgen G, William J, Gray J, Wes G, Mark R, Mike M, Fernando M, Alan C, Stuart M, Michael E, John L, Kirshen S, Michael C, Tony Z, Seth R, Martin B, Peter M, and Jonathan C. Thank you so much to all of you. And an equally big uh, Mac Geek Gab family shout out and thanks to everyone on the monthly $10 plan that uh, participated in the last month or the last two weeks. Bob L, Jeff P, John V, John D, Kaz M, Michael L, Micah P at 15 every month, Ken L, Clive S, Dave G, Gary B, 
Jeff F. and Joseph B. P. So thanks so much to all of you. You, uh, you know who you are because we just told you. Well, hopefully you already knew who you were before and then you just recognized. That would be interesting. If you don't know who you are, my advice is every day when you wake up, take your driver's license out, hold it up next to the mirror, make sure that's you. And then bonus, you get to check to see if it's your birthday. So that's fun. Right? But. No. The thing is, you know that you rock. You do. That's whether awesome. you know who you are, doesn't matter. You know. <laughs> I hope. You if rock. you know you rock, you should know who you are. But. Mm. But so maybe that's enough. Not. If you just know you rock, maybe that's, a, that's, that's <laughs> enough identity right there. You're good to go. Seriously, thanks, folks. It it means a lot. Yes. Uh, okay, now let's go to Neil. So Neil has a question. He says, uh, "I was curious as to your take on the talking about private cloud." This is what Neil is asking about. He says, "I was curious as to your take on Synology Cloud Station versus Resilio Sync, which used to be BitTorrent Sync." Dave, he says, in listening to one of the recent TMO Daily Observations podcasts, I noted that you seem to be using CloudStation from Synology at this point. Uh, he says, if my memory serves me correctly, I seem to remember that at one time in the past, you were a user of BitTorrent slash Resilio Sync, likely back when it was still being called BitTorrent Sync. He says, I may well re be re misremembering that, however. He says, in any case, I agree with the comments in that episode, which I'll link to, uh, regarding own cloud. Uh, and own cloud is a, uh, open source ish self hosted solution. You can host it on a Synology, but you can also host it on a Mac mini or, or a Linux machine or a windows machine. It's that kind of thing. And then there is something called next cloud, which is sort of a spinoff of open of own cloud does the same thing. Uh, he says the comments regarding own cloud, where you said it's just too confusing and too annoying to configure and not worth the effort. He says, I tend to agree with. He says next cloud supposedly based on own cloud, but with much of the complexity and configuration addressed could be an option. He says for personal cloud, but I still don't see the advantage of either of these packages versus the other two alternatives. He says, I've been using cloud station for some time and have found it to be quite reliable and extremely easy to use. I've also got a license for Resilio sync. It was a discounted price and I figured the cost was uh, not so big. So why not? However, I have found it to be much more uh, confusing and cumbersome and have really not wound up using it. So I would appreciate your thoughts on whether it is a compelling reason to use Resilio over CloudStation or any of the others. So you are correct, Neil. Good memory. Uh, when I moved to, you know, I used Dropbox for, as I think many of us did, you know, back when that was really the only option. Right up until I got my first Synology and found CloudStation and thought, okay, this is great. I can host my own cloud. So we're just talking about syncing files here, right? Which is, I mean, I say just talking about, it. it's a huge game changer for us when it happened, you know, years ago. Uh, and so CloudStation was what I started using. And that was on my first Synology. And uh, I relied on it for all my sync data. And then I switched to BitTorrent Sync when CloudStation stopped reliably syncing my data, there was some weirdness with the way it was parsing things on my Mac and it got to be unreliable and BitTorrent Sync had sort of hit the market. So I started using that and that worked out great. Right up until the time uh, that BitTorrent Sync stopped being reliable, there was something about tildes and file names and yeah, it was almost like the same experience, right? It was like, oh, here we well, are. Well, it sounds again. like they were both trying to disappoint you. Yeah, but, but about but, the same time but is at like different the, the, times, right? The, like, right. which is good. Yeah. So I went back at that point to Cloud Station uh, after doing some testing, of course, and making sure that they had fixed the problems. And, you know, the Synology folks are, are really Apple fans and Apple users. So I knew that this problem would likely get fixed, you know, and it, and it did. And Cloud Station I've been using and relying on for maybe the last three or four years now. And like, I haven't thought twice about it. it. It works really, really well. Whether or not Resilio Sync has fixed those things. I, in fact, I think they have. I think I text, tested it and it was, it's fine now. But, um, and it, you know, the, the, the differences between uh, Resilio Sync and CloudStation, which now CloudStation is being called Drive by Synology, but it's the same thing. Uh, the difference is that- Is it? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's 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 the same. Okay, so base. they rebranded it. Yeah. No, because the thing is, yeah. I've seen the name change, so they've changed the name of the, a lot of their things. But right. all right, so CloudStation is now Drive. 
but yeah, it's the and same it, product. It's yeah, it's the same. Unlike like Photo Station is now Moments, and that's a completely complete ground up rewrite of of the way all okay. that works. But but with Cloud Station, I, I mean, I think the process is still so, still called Cloud State Cloud Station Sync or something, right? So, um, with Cloud Station, the way that it works is 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 very much a client server model. So if you know the, 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 your Synology, which is what makes it private is the server. And then all of your clients sync with that. They don't sync with each other with Resilio sync, which it's important and, and helpful to remember that it used to be called BitTorrent sync. There is no server. It is all peer to peer, but it's not BitTorrent in that it's like sharing with everybody. It's just sharing with your machines and it will do it over the LAN or over the WAN and, uh, and all of that stuff, you know, and it, it works well. Uh, and you can set up and I had it set up that, uh, I was running BitTorrent or now Resilio sync on my Synology. So it was participating in this and acting as sort of, you know, the fixed storage for these things, but it was no more, it was a client just like everything else. Whereas with drive or cloud station, it's a, you know, it is the server. Um, so, you know, his question is, is relevant though. He says, you know, is there a compelling reason to use Resilio sync over cloud station? And there absolutely is one. And that's if you don't have a Synology disk station, cause you can only use cloud station <laughs> on the Synology, right? So if you don't have one of those, then Resilio sync is a great option for private cloud. And, uh, if you want to go further than just file syncing, then that's where this own cloud and next cloud would be um, options to consider because they do certainly do this file syncing, but they also do Cal CalDAV server, a CardDAV server, a mail server. If you want, like it, it, a lot of the things that we talk about hosting as servers with our Synologies, cloud station or sorry, own cloud and next cloud will do on say a Mac mini and, you know, sort of makes setup. Uh, I don't know if it's easy or not, but it's just, it's there. So hopefully that helps. You think that helps, John? It could. The thing Good. I like about Synology is that they offer their service that lets you access their thing from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and own necessarily... cloud does that too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember Synology's name for it, but um, oh yeah, no, they have they have a remote. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like everything, like everybody else, they keep changing the name. But the thing is, they do have a service where you can use a DDNS to access their stuff from outside. Yeah, you just type in, you know, your your device's name dot Synology dot me or whatever, me. Yep. right? And um, so that's a nice feature as well, which. You know, if you're considering a, a cloud, a private cloud service, you may want to consider, well, how, how the heck are you going to get to it? Right. Yeah. Synology. IP address or. They, they or, call it Quick Connect, John. Yes. I had, okay, to, I had to look that's it up. That's what they too. call it. Yeah. 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 But you and I both use it and I love it because, yeah. So I'm on my iPhone and it's like, well, I'm going to see a file on my Synology. Well, yeah. Because I have that name locked in, uh, they make it easy. Yep. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to think. Yep. Cool. You want to uh, take us to Chris, John? Chris has a good one, which I think is open to discussion, my friend. So okay. Chris says, hey, guys, I've got a hard one for you. Well, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, maybe we'll know. see, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for suggestions on how I can store my PDF files so they are on my desktop machine, safely backed up and somehow accessible for my mobile devices. But and he put them in all caps, so that's why I'm. Uh, without using cloud storage as I'm trying to cut my expenses. My PDFs are mostly textbooks and, and software manual plus scan receipts. I don't like Evernote, which is what I'm using at the moment. I do have a Yo Jimbo license I could pull out of mothballs, but when I had a look at it recently, it really felt a decade out of date. And their iPad app is close to useless, right? Um, I also want something cross-platform if I can use as my servo. I'm sorry. I also want something cross-platform so I can use my video. Uh, I can use as my video edit box, which is Windows 10. All right. So he has a Windows server. Oh, OK. I got it. So he needs he <clears throat> needs to be able to store his PDF somewhere. It, he's look. It sounds like he's looking for public or private cloud. Right. Correct. 
and he wants it to be cross-platform iOS, macOS, Windows. Right. So he's ha- he has a Windows server that he's storing his data on, but he also has Mac devices. To continue, he says, I've tried storing them on the server and tried to pull the files on my iPad, but can't get either Document 6 or Goodreader to connect to the SMB share. SMB being the Windows protocol for sharing your files. Right. Any bright ideas? Well, and this is Chris from New Zealand. So, hello, New Zealand. Wow. People in New Zealand listen to us? Well, they That's speak awesome. English. Makes it easy. <laughs> Oh, it well, is, they speak, right? They yeah. speak New Zealand, right? Well, uh, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, they have, right. They have, they so have hey, great here's accents. Here's my response is is. as follows. So, Chris, to address your media con- issue, so I'm going to kind of come at this sideways, Dave, okay. but I, I, I want to have a discussion. Yeah. But to address your media concern or issue of not being able to access a Windows or SMB share from your iOS device, which can be tricky, I would think you admit, Dave. Yeah. Um, but I found the following app does a great job. And we mentioned it in the past and I found it and I'm going to tell you about it again, but it's called file explorer file manager. And they say, well, Hey, access files in your computer or your NAS. And it's from sky Joss, S K Y J O S. So we'll put a link of that in the show yeah. notes, but basically it's an app, an iOS app that will talk to not only iOS and SMB shares, but also a lot of cloud services. And uh, they have a free version, and they have a give me money version. Um, when I tried this, Dave, so I connected actually. So my Synology advertises itself as a SMB share, and actually, when you run this program, it comes up and it's like, oh yeah, I see Mac, and uh, so I see AFP and SMB shares. You want me to connect to them? Give me the password, and it worked great. So. That addresses his media concern, which is why can't I get to PDF files on my Windows machine? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah fair. But I, but I think we have a larger issue here, which is it sounds like he's looking for a long-term PDF repository. It, well, it, he's it, looking for a repository, right? It, it could be PDF <laughs> specific, but it doesn't have to be. E- Evernote is certainly an option. Right. But which he, we use because yep. we put PDFs in Evernote and then you and I can search and, you know, cab, uh, you know. But z- he, it, you know, as with Dropbox, but, uh, you know, he's worried about paying for cloud storage. Um, we just talked about Resilio Sync, which for most of what he wants to do, I think would be free. We also talked about own cloud or next cloud also available for free. Uh, which he and then run. I mentioned, yeah. And yeah. then I tossed into the ring here. So Synology recently launched their Office product. The only unfortunate thing, Dave, is that from what I can see, is that their Office product doesn't specifically support PDFs. It supports Office formats, yeah. and maybe yeah. you can squeeze a PDF in there. But I think my my general advice to um, my general advice to Chris is you. You want to? I think you want to seriously look at a private cloud solution, whether yeah. it be. <clears throat> excuse me, and and the one thing I mentioned is actually we we don't. I don't know if we, we we've used their product enough, but Dave. But, but one thing that occurs to me, Dave, is that Western Digital makes a thing called My Cloud, which is basically a drive and a NAS and and a cloud, very similar to what Synology and a lot of the other NAS vendors offer. Which is okay. Kind here's a drive. Of. You put it on the network. Okay. Go. Yeah. Because um, I haven't I, I haven't used I've used it. The WD cloud thing recently, but I see they advertise the fact that well we offer a cloud thing. But they do. if you've had more hands on. Yeah, it, no, they do. It's just it it's really it's feature limited. I get the feeling that okay. for for listeners of this show, you'd probably hit the walls there pretty pretty quickly. Right. Because it's it's very much a here is the path that you shall walk to uh, to sync things with this device. And and nothing outside that path is even remotely possible. And their their iOS app was, uh, frankly, a little wonky. Uh, it, it's been okay. a little while since I've tested it, but it it did not blow me away. Uh, what does what does interest me? And I actually have one here that I need to test is the new box that Promise came out with. 
that is, again, built, you know, to be s- similar, right? Private cloud and all that stuff. So I'm excited mm. about that. Um, and and, I'm, and we'll we'll circle back to that in a, the next week or so here. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I honestly would go with, like, Resilio Sync for him and and see how no, that No, sure, works. as long as the uh, – yeah. uh, so I think the challenge was that, you know, can you get a client on your OS that understands PDFs? And the thing is, out of the box, iOS doesn't do a really great job of that, right? Uh, iOS I, – um, I, I'm – I, I think I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. I mean, iOS obviously can deal over with PDFs. SMB, over SMB, oh. which is his use case. Yeah, he's uh, got to uh, get over SMB. iOS isn't the best no. choice to access. Uh, yes, PDFs over SMB. I thought. That, yeah, I'm sorry. I was. I had left SMB behind. So, but yes, I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah. He's, he needs a different a different answer. Yeah. Yeah. And if they just added, you know, they, I, I was looking and uh, so now, of course, in, in the latest iOS, you have files, which has plugins for various cloud services and other optional services. And actually, that's another thing. When when I was looking at files, it was yeah. like, oh, well, you want to use TS file for this, mm-hmm. <laughs> which Absolutely. is Synology's solution to let you access files using their, you know, yeah. amazing technology. Yeah. So, um. So yeah, it's a it's a tangled web sometimes, Dave. It, it is, yeah, it is. It's um, yeah, but you know, we'll get there. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Hope hopefully we we threw some ideas out for Chris that that uh, you know that'll sort it out. But yeah, I I think will, something will stick. I would I would start with Resilio Sync honestly because it's free and nice. Yeah, yeah, and you All might right. it might just work. So I want to talk about our third sponsor, John, which is Jamf Now. We're at J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G. You can create your free account and your first three devices are always free, right? So Jamf now makes it easy to set up and manage and protect all your Apple devices. It's easy to keep track of your own Mac, your own iPad, your own iPhone. But what about the other Apple devices at work, right? As your business grows, even as your family grows, you know, and I'm thinking about this a lot with my daughter away at school, uh, mm. you know, so does your digital inventory and you can't necessarily put your hands on it right away. And that makes it exponentially harder to manage everyone's Apple devices. With Jamf now, you can check your inventory You can distribute Wi-Fi and email settings remotely. Yep, you can configure things. You can deploy apps. You can protect company data. You can even remotely lock or wipe a device as needed from anywhere. Jamf now manages your devices so you can focus on your business instead. And you don't need any IT experience to do this. So, for Mac Geek Gab listeners, start securing your business today. Setting up your first three devices for free forever and then you can add more at just two dollars a month per device right it's that and it starts at just two dollars a month per device because they've added some other features that you can actually get for a little bit more so uh but your first three devices are free you add more starting at just two dollars a month per device create your free account today at jamf.com slash mgg that's jamf.com slash mgg our sincere thanks to Jamp for sponsoring this episode. All right, uh, I got a note from Ed, John, and I and he, he reminded me that we never really followed up on this. He said, uh, oh, "I've been waiting." Sorry, Ed. Yeah, he says, "I've been waiting for your review of the Sonos Beam that came out earlier this summer." He says, "I have two uh, older Sonos speakers, and I need a new one to get airplay on all of them." I want to get the beam, but have been waiting for your thumbs up first. So I, I did. Weren't you just there? I was. In the last week? I'm I, sorry. I saw your tweets. I, no, I, just I was. Interject. So uh, they, they they like you and you like them. Absolutely. Uh, oh, I've, I, you know, any listener to the show knows that I've been a fan of Sonos for what, like seven years since I, I found it. I mean, it, they, they really do a great job. Their, their entire experience is very Apple-like in that they make st- they make things that are difficult to do and they make them just work and they make them sound really good. And being both picky with technology and picky with audio, it was sort of a natural fit that I might like Sonos. And, and as it turns out, I do. Uh, and yes, I was there this past week 
I have nothing to say about that yet, John. <laughs> um, How about the game? How about the game? I saw you were. I guess right. Yeah, we went to a Red Sox game. I went to my. This is going to sound strange to people who live in New England and around <laughs> Boston. I have been to Fenway Park many times for concerts, John. But what last Wednesday night was my first ever uh, home Red Sox game. I, I'm pretty sure I saw the Red the Red Sox play the Yankees as a kid. Down at Yankee Stadium, you know, the old Yankee Stadium. But uh, but this is my first time seeing them at home. That's so cool. Uh, it was. It's a beautiful stadium, especially for a baseball game. It's It kind of sucks for concerts, but for a baseball game, it, it it's great. It really is. Um, so I did publish my official review of the of the beam, and I will I will link to that in the show notes. And absolutely, I, I gave it a, a thumbs up. And in, in fact, uh, comparing it to their play base, which they came out with. So the beam is, is a, it's a sound bar, right? And it's, it, you could put it in any room of the house. And really there's many rooms where it might work just great, but it has an HDMI input or an optical input so that you can uh, use it as the sound uh, uh, delivery method for your TV as well as for your music. And then because Sonos is wireless. Really? Oh, yeah. It's awesome, man. Well, now they call it a bar. So I've seen some other bars at some other trade shows we've been to. And, mm -hmm. and in my mind, Dave, a bar is something you put under your TV to give you better TV. But that's right. I could be totally wrong. No, that's what or this is. Maybe not. Yeah, no, but that's, it could that's also exactly be what it is. Yeah. A music device. It could complement your, your existing audio setup. Or it could be your audio setup. It'll, it, it has, oh. a, a, it's, it is, it, I mean, it's stellar for music. Okay, so, so at least in the case of Sonos, what do they got? Go. Yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, they have a lot of different things in the product line. Their previously announced um, Playbase and Play Bar, which were also built for the TV, uh, are six ninety nine a piece. This Beam is three ninety nine. So already, it's way more economical, and. I will, I will, at the risk of sounding a little bit too pompous, I will quote from my own review about the beam <laughs> because I think it actually answers Ed's question. And in that I wrote, the only problem I see, and it's not really a problem, is that the beam might make it difficult for Sonos to sell too many more play bases. Uh, this is not a problem for us as users. The beam sounds so... Uh, you know, we have one, we've tested it. All of us in the house can definitely tell the difference between the $399 beam and the $699 play base. But none of us could tell you which one sounds better. They, they have different sound signatures, but they are both stellar. And so with that, take the extra 300 bucks, put it back in your pocket, get the beam. <laughs> and here's the interesting thing about, you know, there's just timing, right? Um, we had we had the play base and then I got the beam to test that and we put it in the living room, obviously, because that's where we need to test. And I put it right near where the, the play base is because, you know, it's the TV. They all kind of have to be in the same spot. And it remained that way until yesterday. My son and I were talking about sono stuff and i'm like yeah it's kind of ridiculous we have the you know the beam and the play base both in the in the living room he's like we do I'm like yeah, yeah of course we do he's like well which one do we use i'm like well we kind of go back and forth he's like okay well you know we have another tv downstairs which one do we want in the main living room and which one do we want downstairs and it was like i i actually prefer the beam well, let's let's use the beam in the, in the main living room we can move the play base downstairs and so i mean don't get me wrong the play base sounds freaking amazing, um, but so does the beam. It, there, there really is no difference. So as of yesterday, we are running the living room solely on, well, not solely. The beam is at the core of it. We also have a sub and we've got a couple of speakers to use as rears so that we have a full, you know, 5.1 system. But um, but even, even comparing them without that stuff, uh, I still like the beam certainly enough to, to justify, to not even suggest justifying the the additional cost of the play base so yeah man mm. short version ed thumbs up man go get it it's awesome really really well done and the beam supports airplay 2 and the cool part oh. is what's and, airplay 2 what does that let you do does it let you like target multiple yeah devices yeah. oh yeah no, yeah, I knew that. It's great. I can't do it because I don't think I can. 
<laughs> yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. Well, and what's cool is, you know, so we have some Sonos speakers that are AirPlay 2 capable, like the Beam, and and many that aren't. Like Ed, you know, he's got two older speakers that aren't, they just don't have the processing horsepower. Sonos does their level best to update the, the software on their devices to add new features all the time. Even devices that are 10 years old are constantly getting new features. But sometimes the hardware limits what the software can do. And, and in this case, I, my guess, I don't have any inside info on this, but my guess is that both CPU and RAM on some of these older devices aren't enough right. to have the buffers that Apple requires for AirPlay 2. But here's the cool part. If you start AirPlaying to or AirPlay 2-ing to something like, say, the, the Beam, and you have other Sonos devices. Well, Sonos devices can be paired with one another. So if you have like an older Play 3 in the kitchen and a Beam in the living room, guess what? You can AirPlay to the Beam. And then from the Beam, you can sync your music as you always can with the uh, the Play 3 in the living room or in the kitchen. And you're good to go. So and you you can play the same music in both places. So, yeah, it works really. It it. it it's interesting when they announced AirPlay 2, it was like, ah, yeah, okay. Like I didn't quite get it, to be perfectly honest. I'm like, well, I've already like I've already invested. I my home is a Sonos home. I don't know that I care about adding AirPlay 2 to this. And then, I don't know, just a couple of weeks ago I was doing something and I was like, yeah, I really would like to have the sound of this. Oh, I was watching a a fish concert, like a live streamed fish concert on my iPad in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I was about to take a shower and I'm like, I would love to have this stream on just audibly. I wasn't going to bring my iPad into the shower, but you know, I have a Sonos in the bathroom. We could have brought your, uh, don't you have these speakers that you, uh, you I love? I, well, that's it. The Sonos speakers were great in the bathroom and I okay. have, I have one in the, you know, in the master bath. And I thought, oh yeah, I would, I could airplay to the speakers. And then it was like, but I could airplay to all of the speakers in the bedroom <laughs> And sure enough, that's what I did. And so I had my iPad, you know, <sighs> sitting in the bedroom and I was air playing to the speakers throughout the house. And it, and then, and this is what convinced Lisa and I that we need a TV in the kitchen is I, uh, we went to cook down to cook dinner and it was like, okay, well, we're not in the living room. So let's bring the iPad into the kitchen. And we watched the show on the thing while we had the audio going through the Sonos. And it was like, okay. Now I get airplay too. Got it. I'm fully on board. So I think you guys are just out of control. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah. I Got mean, it. one kid's gone and you're kind of getting wild with the audio here. I mean, I, I don't know where, where this yeah, is. Our going. kids came yeah. home that night. So we had, Oh, okay. It was just a, like, it was a, um, it was just a fish every now and then will, will do like, they do live streams of, of most of their shows, video live yeah. streams. But, um, and actually, they, they use a lot of Apple hardware for that. We might have the guy that does that, this guy, Brad, that does that. We might have him on the show here. It's because it's really interesting to learn about how they do that. Oh, but yeah. Oh, it, Brad. I mean, dude. I mean, Brad. I mean, we got to have Brad. Brad on. Sterling. Yeah. Um, but uh, they happened to offer a free stream this one night. And it was like, OK, great. And so the kids get home and and, you know, we'd had it on. And so wait, they freely stream their live shows. Are some, you, kidding me? you can most of them you have to pay for. But sometimes they'll offer a freebie because, you know, they want to get you hooked. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, smart. Yeah. And so yeah. this was one night where they happened to do a freebie. And I was like, OK, cool. And, uh, you know, so there we are sitting on the couch or whatever. It, it's it uh, amongst the. The live music community, this is called Couch Tour, John, where you sit on the couch and you watch the right. Exactly. So we're sitting there and the, and the kids like walked in. I, maybe Lucas was at camp. Skylar was like out at a friend's house or something. And she gets home at like midnight and she sees us, you know, sitting there on the couch watching a fish show. She's like, what like, is happening? around?" My parents here? are such nerds. Yeah. She's like, I don't I don't even get it. You know, she's like, yep. Yeah. So I'm not going to tell my friends what you're doing. Oh, no, she loves to tell her friends. Yeah, I know. She's like, this is like, my friends are going <laughs> to. What nerds this. your parents are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. My dad thinks he knows about the Internet and podcasting. And right. Podcasting. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's great. <laughs> so cool. Uh, right. You think we have time to squeeze in this one more from Dusty here, John? Uh, Dusty is a good discussion point. Right. But I think I, I I think I got it on on should the we, mark. Should we save it here. for the next episode and do Doug or or do we do Dusty? 
Well, let me look at Doug. Hold on. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do a quick cool stuff found here then, John, uh, because Gary sent in a very cool thing and it'll be quick while you look at that. Windows 95 is now available as a Mac app. Oh, I saw that on my, yes. my feed. Yes. As an app? Yep. You can download. Number one, why would you even want that? Yep. But. Well, <laughs> I mean, look, Windows 95 was sort of pivotal in the whole evolution of operating systems and all that, right? I mean, they copied the heck out of Mac OS, but that aside, it was kind of a thing. So we'll put a link in the show notes to this. Gary sent it in. This is a, it's a very cool thing. So thank you, Gary. And 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 there, did I give you enough time to answer the? Uh, the oh no, question? Dusty. No, Dusty is good, and I think I, I'd like your input here. Right, and go I think ahead. it's a, it's good. To, so Dusty says, "Good morning, MGG crew," which I guess is me and you. Ham radio. No, it's was everybody. My hobby. It's all. The, it's the it's the Mac yes. Geekab family, man. It's the family. Yeah. yeah. So ham radio is one of my hobbies, and I have a connectivity issue. The programming software for a couple of my radios is Windows only. Boo. I have just this week gotten a new MacBook Pro replacing my 2011. The weight and the size had me thinking I will have it with me a lot more than my previous laptop. Awesome. Cool. And I'm thinking about an upgrade, but we'll talk about yeah, that in another same. episode. Yeah. So anyways, I have installed VirtualBox, which is uh, currently uh, an Oracle virtualization product, and Windows 7. I have no problem poking around the settings on virtual box to get things to show up most of the time but a couple of radios but a couple radios required the installation of a virtual com port driver okay so this is a windows thing where sometimes they'll yeah you gotta yeah. install a driver not so much on the mac but windows sometimes has this so anyways so he ran into this on the uh, in the windows environment um I think if I can find the radio, I can probably map the device to a port, but can't even seem to get the MacBook Pro to react to the radio getting plugged in. And here's the key, and maybe I should cut it off at this point here. Okay. You think? Sure. I think I can cut it off. All right. Here's the problem. So the thing is, Dusty, VirtualBox is a fine virtualization product. The thing is, it has one little problem, which you found. And the thing is, I actually used VirtualBox when I was doing the corporate serial industrial device thing. And VirtualBox is a fine product, but here's the problem. It doesn't necessarily tell you what is going on. And that's the problem here. Because I verified this because, Dave, I actually, in addition to you and I updating our Parallels licenses, which apparently they've changed their model, and yep. you sent me a license, and yay, so I'm running Parallels. So I could use it as a comparison point. But the thing is, VirtualBox doesn't really deal with the presence of USB devices like Parallels does. God I'm going to tell you what Parallels does. Okay. When you run Parallels and you plug in a device, so I used my uh, uh, ScanSnap, one of my Fujitsu ScanSnap yeah. scanners, and I plugged it in. And as soon as I plugged it in, Dave, Parallels said, hey, um, I see a USB thing. Do you want me to give it to the Mac or do you want to? Give it to the PC. Here's the problem, Dave. VirtualBox doesn't do that. Uh... <clears throat> Out of the box. Now, the thing is, for what you're paying for it, which is nothing, <laughs> right. yeah. it operates in a slightly different fashion. So here's the problem. So, Dusty, I think you're going to find that this will work for you. So the thing is, there actually is a little... So if you go to the bottom of the screen when you run VirtualBox, you will see a little connector that looks like a usb connector click on that when you click on that it's going to show you all the devices that it sees and actually it's kind of weird because initially it'll say oh i see your facetime camera your ir receiver which i have on my mac sure and a bluetooth controller and then it blanks out keyboard because you're just going to make your life miserable if you choose that but the thing is if you plug in a device by default VirtualBox does not give you any sort of indication whatsoever that it's plugged in. But if you click on this little menu, it'll show you an additional device. So I plugged in my ScanSnap uh, S1100. And the thing is, on the menu, it shows that device there. The thing is, it doesn't tell you anything about it unless you choose it manually. If you choose it manually, and I did this because I actually, I did not have a uh, VM set up for this, Dave. Sure. But I actually reinstalled a Windows XP 
because I'm kicking it old school, yo. Yeah. Um, I like as as I- of all Windows versions. I really liked XP. Like it, but that was reliable. XP balanced. Yes. Performance with eye candy, and that it didn't have too much. And I still right. know a lot of programmers. Now, the thing is, now, if you run it, it'll say, well, dude, I'm not supported anymore. It's like, what? Well, what are you, nuts? But <laughs> I still run a VM using it. But anyways, so to get down to it, um, what you have to do is, number one, in the USB device list, you have to select the device itself. Then Windows will say, oh, I see you. Now I'm going to do the Windows thing, which is either search for a driver or add hardware or whatever Windows does. Right. But the thing is... That's just, uh, I wouldn't say it's a fault, but it's just a, a result of the behavior of um, VirtualBox. The other thing is that you can, so they have a list which you can actually set up a filter list saying, oh, okay, if you see a device called this, then let it automatically connect to the environment. Hmm. And that's the other answer. So, not that VirtualBox is bad and Parallels or VMware is good, but you get what you pay for. Yeah, so. totally. Right. No, that makes sense. So you, you just got to wrestle with VirtualBox a bit in order for it to see your stuff. I'm sure once you now, – now, the thing is, what concerns me is that he says he's using slightly dated ham equipment. The thing is also VirtualBox lets you map – now, remember these, Dave? Com ports. So the thing is, oh, most yeah. modern computers within the last couple of decades use something called USB. Yes. Well, the thing is, Windows machines use something called a COM port, which is a different hardware address and a, just a different strategy. The thing is, VirtualBox does give you the ability to simulate serial ports. So if it comes to that, you should be able to do it. You may have to wrestle with it a bit. but Got it. That's my answer. But but I love this old school stuff, especially using <laughs> software to talk to your ham radio that's Windows only or Windows only software. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, right. I got, yeah, yeah. Man. Well, that's good. Sweet. That's uh I think that's what we got for the day. I like it, man. That's uh this is a fun one. It was good. You folks brought us in good it directions. Was a potpourri. It was potpourri. a potpourri. Yeah, man. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm not up on the potpourri. I, I kind of like your, your crouton thing better. I mean, at least they're edible. I mean, potpourri. I, yeah, don't I, eat I the don't potpourri, know. man. That's worse no. than Tide Pods. I mean, it smells well, nice. Maybe not. But don't <laughs> eat Tide Pods either, kids or adults. All right. Yeah. So we talked about the email. So you don't need to know that. But what you need to know... What, yes. do, what do they need to know, Dave? They need to know to visit us in our forums. Go to macgeekgab.com slash forums. It's, uh, it's a great place. So There's so much stuff going on there. It's been about a day since I've been in there, but I, otherwise I'm there every day. And John's going to be there every day. I recommend, yeah, he John, will. that he you will. subscribe yeah. your RSS reader to the forum posts feed What's that's an right RSS there. Reader? And uh, and then that way, I'll let you figure that What's, out. That's that's an exercise for the the listener. Uh, so I got to find a Mac RSS reader. No, I I don't. I use well, I use one on my iPad. I use Reader R E E D E R. But uh, but you could also mm. use like you know Feedbin or whatever, right? Uh, but uh, I subscribe to the the new posts, and then that way I I just can see right. them. It's great. Yep. I hear you, brother. Uh, so visit us there. It's great. We would love to have you. I want to make sure we thank the folks at Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Of course, all of our sponsors, LinkedIn Talent Solutions, LinkedIn Jobs at LinkedIn.com slash M-G-G. Of course, Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, Jamf at JAMF.com slash MGG. That's right. Smile at SmileSoftware.com slash podcast. Barebones Software at Barebones.com. Ring at Ring.com slash MGG. Codeweavers.com slash MGG. Crossover. Our thanks to all of them. Our thanks to all of you. Seriously, thanks for listening, sending in questions. Thanks for 13 plus years. It's been, it's <gasps> awesome. I know, it's crazy. Do you have anything else, Dave? I think you have one, maybe two, maybe three more things. Yeah. Well, you know, I did. When uh, we dropped 
my daughter off. I'll I'll share with you the piece of advice that I shared with my uh, with my daughter and her I'm, new. I'm gonna I'm gonna cry. And her new roommate. I know. Uh, you know they were there. We had their dorm room set up. We had to leave. It was uh, obviously very emotional. It was awful, frankly. But I did want to give them a good piece of advice, and uh, and I, I think it's one that will last not only them but you through your lives, folks. And that is, whatever you do. Don't get caught. Made up.